Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. In most parts of the world, women have historically been active agitators for peace during times of war and violence. Many movements built in opposition to violence owe their existence to women. Think Women for Peace during the Vietnam War or the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom during World War I. Even in contexts where they were excluded from official avenues of political power. At the same time, gender stereotypes, perhaps unfairly, have pegged men as aggressive war hawks and women as peace-loving earth mothers. Sex striking is a method of passive resistance, a form of peaceful protest, and something attempted by American Indians in the early modern era, first wave feminists in Europe and America, Bolshevik women in the 1920s, Chinese women in the 1940s, and perhaps most famously by the women of Liberia mass action for peace in the early 2000s. Sex strikes are an effective way for disenfranchised women to make their voices heard, but they are a relatively recent phenomenon, despite several clickbaity articles which argue the contrary. So why are sex strikes portrayed as having a long history? And why don't they? Why did they burst on the global scene in the 20th century? Is this a form of sisterhood that spans time and space? Or is it an instance of women buying into the patriarchal system? All this and more as we discuss history's most famous sex strikes. I'm Marissa. And I'm Elizabeth. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. Most official pacifist organizations date to the 19th and 20th centuries, but women have been resisting war and violence since ancient times, and in all corners of the globe. They've resorted to hunger strikes, the taking of religious orders, self-imposed exile, and many other strategies. Perhaps the most controversial method of protest is the sex strike, sometimes called a celibacy strike, sex boycott, or birth boycott. During a sex strike, women organize around a cause and agree to refuse their partner's sex until their demands are met. The most famous sex strike of all is a literary one, the story of Lysistrata, written in the 5th century BCE by Aristophanes. Lysistrata has been plucked from the pages of Greek classical literature and used by feminists and pacifists throughout the centuries to force political change. Lysistrata was first performed in Athens in 411 BCE during Linnea, a Greek festival dedicated to the god Dionysus. At this point in history, Athens and its allies, called the Delian League, had been fighting Sparta and its allies, called the Peloponnesian League. They've been fighting them on and off for 20 years. We now know this conflict as the Peloponnesian War. The war had taxed the societies of all Greek speakers, but in the year that Lysistrata first hit the stage, Athens was in a particularly bad state. It had suffered massive military defeats and the overthrow of their democracy by an oligarchy, and then another political coup by the regime of 5,000. Aristophanes' play was being performed for the first time to an audience that was fed up with war and political turmoil. The plot goes something like this. An Athenian woman named Lysistrata organizes a meeting with women from all the city-states of Greece. She convinces them to withhold sex from their husbands until both leagues agree to sign a peace treaty. She had previously arranged for a group of old women to seize and occupy the Acropolis. And as they hear the Acropolis being taken, they celebrate their oath with a sacrifice to the gods. 
a group of old men try to smoke the women out of the Acropolis. So they begin gathering wood, but the old women foil their plans by pouring water all over the men. <laughs> so they pour water all yeah. over the men or all over the wood? All over the men and the oh. wood. Oh, Carrying, okay. It's supposed to be funny. It's a comedy. So they're okay. they're like, you know, forget you. And they just pour the water on okay. them. And the men go, oh. I, I guess I'm showing my ignorance that I've actually never seen <laughs> this <laughs> or read it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a comedy. So. Okay. Um, a naval commissioner arrives at the Acropolis to do business as usual and finds it's taken over by angry old women. He orders Lysistrata and the old women to be arrested, but the women successfully face and chase away the police. It's also just a comical thing. They don't, like, actually Sounds fight. Sounds like Keystone Cops or something. Like, like there should be, like, exactly, exactly. And then they run away. Um the naval commissioner tells the men of Athens that they've given their women too much freedom, and Lysistrata begins a lively debate with him about the impact the war has had on Greek women. So he's basically saying, why are you, you know, you women are, this war doesn't even affect you. Mm. She tells him that Greek women have lost husbands, sons, and that women looking for partners have no men to marry because they're all fighting or dead. The women end this debate by dressing the commissioner in drag. Over time, the sex strike takes a toll on the men of Athens. Lysistrata sees Kinesius, the husband of Marine, wandering the city with a giant erection in search of his wife. Because, <laughs> dang, that's a problem. She witnesses the couple's conversation, right? Is that is that conversation like conversation? Yeah. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> It's an actual conversation. Okay. Kinesius begs Marine to sleep with him and to come home to him and his children. She holds her ground and tells him that she'll sleep with him once there is a peace treaty between Athens and Sparta. He persists. So she pretends to give in, but asks him to think about the peace treaty while she ventures into the Acropolis to get mats and things for them to lie on. She sneaks away, leaving Kinesius to suffer. Oh, poor, poor Kinesius giant erection yeah it's hard meanwhile a spartan herald arrives also with a painful erection the spartans he says are desperate for the sex strike to end and are ready to negotiate peace as the delegations gather at the acropolis the results of the sex strike are hard to miss all of the men have erections every last one Lysistrata brings a naked woman to the delegation as a distraction while she lectures the men on the shared heritage and productive relationship between Athens and Sparta. Rather than recoil in outrage at being lectured by a woman, the men feel powerless because they're staring at a naked woman and they all have erections, <laughs> and they agree to settle their disputes. Then everyone parties and presumably has lots of sex. The end. The end. <laughs> all right. So they don't show the orgy scene that happens afterwards? Apparently so. not. Mm, I don't want to watch that. <laughs> now, of course, this is fiction. The Peloponnesian War didn't end for another six years after the performance of Lysistrata, and the end had nothing to do with the sex strike. The Athenians and Spartans basically destroyed each other's navies and suffered massive casualties until they had no choice but to lay down arms. But Lysistrata has, in recent history, been used as a sort of feminist guide to protest all over the world. Note that I said recent history, or more precisely the 20th century. Pre-modern examples are few and far between. The only stories we have come from indigenous American cultures, and even these examples don't quite fit the Lysistrata example. Around 1530, native Nicaraguan women declared a strike of the uterus. There's very little information about this event, but it does fit with the historical context. In the 1530s, the Spanish had settled in Nicaragua and were hard at work colonizing the Andes people, so that's the Inca in Peru. The Spanish and Portuguese began setting up mines around South America, mines like Minas Gerais in Brazil, um, and there were also some in Peru. At the same time, Nicaragua and Honduras had massive sedentary populations, so the Spanish and Portuguese targeted those inhabitants as sources of slave labor to work in the mines. The local Cossacks, which are um, the local rulers, uh, local indigenous rulers, participated in the expeditions to gather more natives for the growing trade. Anywhere from 50,000 to 500,000 natives were captured, branded, and exported to mines in Peru and Brazil. 
Many natives died from European diseases, as you'll recall from high school social studies class. Um, And even more Nicaraguans died performing forced labor on indigo plantations. So this is kind of a moment of crisis. Mm -hmm. Native Nicaraguans developed several resistance tactics. Many of them were forms of passive resistance. So not taking up arms and going on the offense, but rather they found areas of their lives that they could control and use against the Spanish. This purported strike of the uterus was a form of passive resistance. Nicaraguan women refused to give birth to children whose lives would not be their own. So they staged a sex strike, not with the goal of inducing painful erections in their menfolk, but so that they could prevent pregnancy and their captives could not benefit from their reproductive labors. This is significantly different from the Lysistrata story because the Nicaraguan women were not targeting husbands, but rather a colonial regime that was enslaving their children. Since they called this protest a strike of the uterus, we can be sure that the reproductive capabilities of their wombs were the focus of their attention. They wanted to stop births, not deprive their partners of sexual release. Since we have so little information about the strike of the uterus, we cannot be sure of its effectiveness. But it may have allowed for enslaved Nicaraguan women to exercise some control over how much they would participate in the regime that enslaved them. This is similar to Mahatma Gandhi's call for celibacy in India in the 1920s. He argued that Indians were birthing children into the colonial system of enslavement. It's obviously not the same kind of enslavement, but these are the words that he used. Um, So he framed his celibacy campaign not only as a spiritual goal, but as a way to undermine the British colonial agenda. The Iroquois example is somewhat more similar to the Lysistrata story, but it still revolved around the reduction of births rather than the denial of sexual release for their menfolk. I suspect this story comes from the Haudenosaunee, which Iroquois actually called themselves, uh, from their oral histories. Sometime in the 17th century, Haudenosaunee women began to resent the tolls that war had on their societies. Traditionally, only Haudenosaunee men had a say in whether the tribe declared war on any neighboring tribes. So Haudenosaunee women banned together and agreed to withhold sex from their partners until they were granted the power to veto declarations of war. Their boycott was doubly effective because they denied their partners the satisfaction of sexual release, but their strike also prevented the birth of new warriors. The Iroquois believed their women had special bodily knowledge about the miracle of birth. So this staged sex strike was all the more threatening to Iroquois men, many of whom were looking forward to producing progeny. They were further indebted to their women because female labor produced the supplies needed for warfare, moccasins, corn stores, and other apparel and tools. In a strategic move, the Haudenosaunee women bolstered the effectiveness of their sex strike by withholding the labor and supplies men needed to wage war successfully. So in some ways, this was not only a sex strike, but a labor strike as well. According to Haudenosaunee histories, the sex strike worked, and from that point forward, Haudenosaunee women had the power to veto declarations of war. Aside from the fictional Lysistrata, there's almost no evidence of a sex strike before modern history. There are several reasons for this. First of all, some women in history actually enjoyed sex just as much as men. Shocking. (laughs) Desire for sex, whether it was for pleasure, duty, or to conceive children, was not exclusive to men. Historical women wanted all these things as well. So any attempts at an organized abstention from sex would have been physically, mentally, and emotionally difficult for women, just like it was for the poor Athenian men with painful erections. A sex strike might not have been something that many women wanted to do. Might have been too much of a sacrifice for some. This is probably one of the biggest problems with the concept of the sex strike. It assumes that men want sex more than women. And that women have some superhuman level of sexual self-control that men just don't have. Um, This is a stereotype, obviously, and one that probably resonated with many historical women but still a stereotype. So it likely did not represent the realities of many historical women. 
Many historical women sought personal fulfillment in active sex lives with their partners and by enthusiastically welcoming the role of motherhood. That being said, women have historically been very successful at other forms of peaceful protest that involved incredible sacrifice and self-denial. So even if this is one reason why sex strikes are not historically common, it's probably not the most significant reason. For that, we have to think about the various ways that people were gendered in past societies. This does not hold true for all times and places, but in patriarchal societies, there were few times and few places where women could safely withhold sex from their partners without risking rape, spousal abandonment, shunning, or legal sanction. Marital rape is both an ethical and a theoretical problem in patriarchal societies, and it's one that we're still struggling with today. In the United States, the criminalization of marital rape was determined by each individual state. It wasn't until 1993 that all 50 states had rewritten rape statutes to criminalize spousal sexual abuse. Marital rape has been a hotly contested issue for hundreds of years. As we discussed in our episode on coverture, and also a bit in our episode on American marriage in this series, married women in England and America were considered property of their husbands. While maidens were considered property of their fathers in medieval Europe, fathers could sue for monetary compensations if their daughters were raped. The loss of her virginity was a considerable financial disadvantage in a time when making a good marriage hinged on a young woman's sexual purity. But still gross. <laughs> it's still gross that a guy could sue for money because his daughter's virginity was taken from her and she had no recourse, even though I kind of understand it. We won't go into detail since we've covered this topic in other episodes, but we want to add that the legal and social structures in most patriarchal societies were similar in this regard. In pre-modern Eurasia, India, African empires, and the rest of the Islamic world, wives were the legal property of their husbands, so their bodies were not their own. Women who had no bodily autonomy couldn't be raped. In some ways, it's theoretically sound. I mean, it's it's despicable, but it's theoretically sound that marital rape was, for millennia, not considered a crime. Only cultures with matrilineal structures or weak conceptions of property were exempt from this reasoning. This is probably why we know of sex strikes among indigenous American cultures. They didn't necessarily view men and women as similar or equal, but they had very loose understandings of personal property. When land and people aren't viewed as personal property, everyone enjoys bodily autonomy. So an event like a sex strike is more acceptable and less dangerous for women in these cultures. Married women who withheld sex from their spouses were also risking spousal abandonment and shunning. These risks varied over time and space. The Catholic Church's influence in medieval Europe, South America, and most of Southwest Africa may have made the strategic of sex easier for wives who lived there. Because of the influence of the Virgin Mary, Roman Catholic doctrine privileges sexual abstention, even within marriage. Celibacy was always preferable to sexuality, even sexuality legitimated by marriage vows. Marjorie Kemp, a medieval Christian mystic, abstained from sex for long periods of time, with her husband's reluctant understanding. There were periods of her life when she herself desired sex, or times when her Christian commitment to her marriage outweighed her desire to become a saint. They had at least 14 children, so obviously... <laughs> a she, decent amount of sex going yes. on. <laughs> but she constantly struggled with her identity as wife and mother, and the calling she felt to be a chaste saint. She did become a saint, right? I want to say... I think she did. I want to say I read an article about her. I think she did, and she's not... If, if she did, um, she's not the only saint who was not chaste. Mm. There were other, there was another saint, I think in, Scan in Scandinavia somewhere, or maybe it was Denmark. Yeah, I think it was Denmark specifically, um, who was a married saint with many children. Mm. So I guess there was some wiggle room there. Um, but yeah, it was something she always struggled with. The Protestant Reformation may have made withholding sex slightly more dangerous for wives in the Christian world. Protestants valued marriage and family life and encouraged married couples to enjoy active sex lives. In some ways, this was a positive change for female sexuality. 
Husbands were encouraged to develop romantic bonds with their wives and to please them in bed. This is when we see um, the theory that if a wife orgasms, that she's more likely to conceive. Mm -hmm. But this emphasis on marital sex made abstention difficult, if not dangerous. When Protestant wives withheld sex from their husbands, they were perceived to be not only bad wives, but also bad Protestants. The functionality of their marriage was an indicator of their state of grace. More liberal divorce laws allowed for the dissolution of Protestant marriages, but most women were unable to survive without their partner's income or social capital. Spousal abandonment, separation, or divorce could quite literally kill them. The patriarchal economies of Protestant cultures, therefore, gave wives few choices when it came to withholding sex. Sex striking would have been impractical and almost unthinkable in these contexts. Not to mention they didn't have, you know, in a Catholic society, they didn't have the option to, to go to a convent. In a Protestant society, they didn't have. That's you said right. Catholic. You said Catholic. Yeah. But I know what you meant. In, well, in yeah, Catholic, what I'm saying, in a Catholic society, they have the option yes. to go to a convent. Right. And in a Protestant society, There is no such thing. Right. 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 The priorities of first wave feminists confirm that until the late 19th century, a sex strike was inconceivable for most wives. 19th century women's rights activists occasionally staged sex strikes in their struggle to obtain suffrage, temperance, and other women-led reforms. But their attempts at boycotting sex magnified some of the personal, intellectual, and structural limitations that prevented any sustained attempts at sex striking in previous centuries. And I want to add that those staged sex strikes were not large there wasn't very many people just individual women were sometimes encouraged to withhold sex if their husbands were alcoholics or whatever um this wasn't some massive uh movement in some ways 20th century women owe their ability to sex strike to the 19th century radical feminists the free love movement and anarchist stephen pearl andrews i know he's a guy <laughs> which I hate giving credit for a women's movement to a guy, but we're going to give him the honorary title of woman because he's pretty cool. In his book, Love, Marriage, and Divorce, and the Sovereignty of the Individual, Andrews argues that what he called the sovereignty of the individual was an important aspect of improving the lives of all people. And I'm going to read an excerpt um, from his book because he says it better than I can. The third and last basis of the family is the protection and maintenance of women themselves. Here again, it does not seem to me that the system in vogue by which the husband and father earn all the money and doles it out in charitable pittances to wife and daughters who are kept as helpless dependents in ignorance of business and responsibilities of life has achieved any decided title to our exalted admiration. Their liabilities are terrible, and daily experiences are cruel in the extreme. The few who, despite the system, attain some development are tortured by the consciousness and the mortifications of their dependency, and the perpetual succession of petty annoyances incident to it, of which their lordly companions, self-congratulatory for their own intentions of kindness, are profoundly unconscious. And he's talking about their husbands. Um, their lordly companions. Um, wives have the same motives that slaves have for professing contentment and smile deceitfully while the hearts swell indignantly and the tears tremble in the eye. Man complains habitually of the waywardness and the perversity of woman and never suspects that he himself and his own false relations to her are the key to the thousand apparent contradictions in her deportment and character. And this is my this is my favorite part. This is my favorite line of all time. The last thing that the husband is likely to know in marriage as it is, is the real state of the heart that throbs next to him as he lays his head upon his own pillow. Woman, as well as a slave, must first be wholly free before she can afford to take the risk to speak freely. She dare not utter boldly her own complaint and she will even denounce openly while she prays fervently in secret for the godspeed of the friend who does it for her so he's saying men criticize women for their inconstancy or like for being fickle or whatever but the thing is women can't actually speak their mind because they're not actually free in marriage right right so basically he's saying that until women have autonomy they can't be their own agents right 
Um, every time they cook dinner for the family, have sex with their husbands, or bear another child, these things are done in a state of coercion because there are no other alternatives. If their bodies and their livelihoods were their own, they would have real choices in this world. And this ideology was lauded by feminists like Victoria Woodhall, um, the focus of last week's episode, Mary Gove Nichols, and Marion Craig Wentworth. Nichols was a physician on the feminist lecture circuit in the 1840s and 1850s. She taught women the specificities of female anatomy and encouraged them to exercise autonomy within their marriages. During her first marriage, she suffered abuse and coercive sex that resulted in many difficult pregnancies, stillbirths, and miscarriages. Andrew's ideas resonated with her, and she took up public activism and authorship for the rest of her life. Nichols was known for telling her women audiences that they had the right to their own bodies. She encouraged women to withhold sex from abusive spouses, to avoid injury, and establish their bodily autonomy within the relationship. She also asserted women's rights to withhold sex in loveless marriages if they found themselves in that difficult situation. So if you didn't love your husband, you didn't have to have sex with him. And that's pretty radical for the time. Yes. Nichols went so far as to challenge the institution of marriage altogether. In her 1845 book, she wrote, Ladies of the Women's Rights Movement, you must look this question full in the face. When you demand women's rights, you demand the abrogation of marriage. When you declare independence, it is independence of man in the relation of marriage. You can have no right until you assert your right to yourselves. That's pretty heavy. I know. That's, yeah, it's intense, right? Now, most 19th century women were not ready to swear off marriage entirely. These activists were particularly radical, but Andrews and Nichols were integral to the reframing of women's bodily autonomy in their sexual relationships. As radical feminism developed and the 20th century came to be, groups such as the Women's Social and Political Union contemplated the effectiveness of an organized sex strike. Writing in the 19-teens, Lucy Ree Bartlett praised what she called the celibacy strike. This is a quote from her Sex and Sanctity. That's the name of her book. I think it was published in 1915. And it may be that some recognition of this need for a totally different womanhood forms part of the great force which lies behind the celibate strike. First and foremost, that the strike is positive in character, as has been said. It is a direct and indispensable preparation for the new and wider love. But it may be that in lesser degree, it also has a negative mission, that it has to work not only as an appeal to the new and higher manhood, but also as a correction and instruction to the old. Against that purely physical valuation of women, which amongst one type of man has reigned undisturbed for so many centuries, it may be that no such speaking force can today be brought as women's voluntary celibacy. Let primitive men call such women incomplete and abnormal if they will. They may still learn something from them. It is a new incompleteness which they are obliged to take into their consciousness, and in time the new picture may balance and correct the old. Women purely mental will surely never command full reverence any more than women purely physical, but maybe she has got to have her day ere women complete may rise. And something of this is present, possibly in the hearts of many celibate women today, and even on its negative side, yield sanctity to the celibate strike. Marion Craig Wentworth was an American playwright and suffragette who wrote an immensely popular anti-war play called War Brides in 1915. In the play, a pregnant war widow kills herself rather than give birth to another child for a nation that required her sacrifices but did not grant her the right to decide its policies. The play was wildly successful and was made into a silent film the next year that made a $300,000 profit. That was big money in those days. Yes, and that's um, profit. That's not what it grossed. Right. So that's... Yeah. So this was immensely popular stuff. Wentworth became a household name in feminist and pacifist circles. At the height of the play's popularity, Wentworth was quoted as having said, The sex strike of a million women would make war by the United States or any other country absolutely impossible. Women hold the gift of life in their hands, and they have the right to refuse the gift if life is to be desecrated by war. And, you know, it's it's uh, so I, I've read a lot of um, like uh, 
um, Senate testimony and things like that. Um, basically, uh, women trying to get the Shepherd Towner Act passed, which was an right. act in 1921 for women and children. And and a lot of that language was used. Like, uh, you know, our our children have basically been like, you know, fed to the to the machine of war and they've died. And you right. know, it's, it's, it's all this stuff. And we have no control over it. But here, this bill that we're trying to pass is going to like give women control of like what happens to their son's bodies as opposed to like being shipped off to war. Right. So it was a very kind of um, I can see why it was so popular and right. uh, and why it grossed so much, because it really was kind of part of this kind of, um, you know, what was kind of going around in the ether with women right. at the time. But that's a very 20th century thing. Um, the you know, the earlier examples that we mentioned, they don't frame their their reproductive capacity in that way. They're not like saying, oh, I'm just giving birth to a child that the state is going to take away. I guess the only, the Nicaraguan example is sort of similar yeah, because their children are being, but their children are being born into like actual slavery. So it's hard to, you don't want to make that exact comparison. Sure, but, sure. Well, um, and I mean, I guess I, I've been wondering where I should point it out and I'll just do it here. Um, you know, in the American South, uh, slave owners and slave masters were always very conscious of their slaves taking any kind of birth control, right? Any kind right. of herbs that would yeah. keep them from giving birth, which of course was a, was another form of passive resistance, right? And right. so that was very kind of common is to, you know, make sure that you don't have a, a quote unquote wise woman, you right. know, in the slave cabins that's going to, you know, teach everybody how to prevent pregnancy. Right. Because after the abolition of the trade, natural increase is the only thing they have going for them. So right. they want to protect their investment. Right. You know? And so alternatively, that's a type of sex strike, you know, it's, yeah. it's a type of it not is. having your progeny. Yeah entered into the yeah. slave trade. And it is. Know. It's withholding sex, but you're not trying to punish the person you're withholding the sex from. You're right. trying to punish the people who are subjugating right. you. Right, yeah. right, right. We can see here that the concept of sovereignty of the individual developed during the 19th century women's rights movement made sex strikes possible, and not just for the 19th century white women. Despite their sophisticated ideology and their ability to export that ideology across the globe, American white women did not stage any systematic sex strikes. Yet still, the radical feminist influence was a global one. We may struggle with this part because I think historians and, you know, me specifically, kind of see American hegemony as a bad thing. So the fact that American culture has kind of washed over the entire world, like it seems sort of weird and it's it's a uncomfortable thing to sit with but that's there's you're not an american yeah because i'm not an americanist <laughs> I'm, um, that is why um but there's no doubt that these ideas about sovereignty of the individual and bodily autonomy of women were systematically exported to other parts of the world of course these ideas are not white and american in origin but their development of feminist ideology at a critical time in the history of women was still an important event only after this period do we start to see the emergence of what one might call a tradition of sex striking among women across the globe. And by and large, the women who put these ideas into action were women who did not have the privileges enjoyed by American first wave feminists, many of them women of color. In Russia, the women's liberation movement had its historical moment quite early on. Communists were the first to embrace the feminist agendas of 19th century radicals. So this strikes me as interesting because once again, we see an association between the destruction of personal property rights and the liberation of women. Like the Haudenosaunee hundreds of years earlier and thousands of miles away, the Bolsheviks rejected the entire concept of personal property. This understanding that women could not ever be their husband's property inspired a thriving women's liberation movement and allowed the Russian women in the province of Bryansk to stage an organized sex strike. The women of Bryansk were fed up with the spousal abuse and their historical lack of recourse. They delivered the following address and publicly pledged to boycott sex with their partners until all the men in their province signed a contract which said they would treat women better. And here's a tiny excerpt from the speech that uh, movement leaders delivered. We agree to work at home and be our husband's helpers, but demand in return that we shall not be given over to our husband's wills, that they shall not be so free with their hands and call us such names as old hag, bitch and slut and other unmentionable ones. And this, too, we add 
We shall not disperse and not return to our husbands until they have all signed their names to this paper. Damn. I know. <sighs> Throwing down the gauntlet? What's the word? I don't know what the saying. I'm terrible at sayings. Let's... Um, the sex gauntlet. Communism also brought women's liberation to China in the 1930s and 1940s. In an attempt to mobilize as many people as possible, the Communist Party of China executed a deliberate strategy to involve women in politics. Think of it. Just, they were like, oh, wait, half of the entire population is women. We should probably get them in on this. Maybe. Um, smart. Women fought alongside male communist troops in the Civil War with Chinese nationalists. The Civil War was suspended temporarily during World War II, while the communists and nationalists banded together to stave off Japanese invasions. During this time, areas outside of Japanese control saw an unprecedented growth in women's organizations. One survey of Chinese socialist organizations found that women were allowed to belong to general peasant organizations, but only areas with women-only associations achieved high levels of female participation in the movement. Because they would say, women would say, they would go to um, socialist peasant organization meetings and they would say, well, we go there and the men just won't let us talk and mm. won't listen to us and, and everything. And so um, the parts of communist China that had the most female participation were areas that had uh, women-only organizations. Gotcha. Tinghu Village was one of these places where women-only associations thrived. When a new village chief was elected sometime in the early 1940s, a woman named Chan Shu Ying led a successful sex strike against the new elected official. The women of Tinghu had been barred from voting or running in the election. Chan Shu Ying was in an unhappy marriage and was purportedly a lesbian. This might have just been an attempt at slandering her because of the events that followed, but we can't be sure. Harnessing the resentment from this unhappy union, Chan Shu Ying convinced the rest of the women in the village, who were also angry about their exclusion from the election, to withhold sex from their husbands in protest. At first, the men failed to take the threat seriously, but the women of Tinghu held strong. Eventually, the men capitulated and organized another election, this time granting the women of Tinghu the right to vote. Their turnout was so strong that they won the seat of vice village chief. Sex strikes have become increasingly common in the last two decades, but the most influential example is the sex strike that ended the Second Liberian Civil War in 2003. Lima Bowie, one of the leaders of the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011. She shared the prize with um, fellow Liberian President Alan Johnson Sirleaf and a Yemeni native named um, Tawakal Karman. And the Yemeni native it wasn't involved in the Liberian strike. They just um, they gave the they gave the award to three people that year. The Liberian civil wars are extremely complicated affairs, but we want to give you some context in which to understand this very famous sex strike. The Liberian government was overthrown in a coup in 1980 by an army master sergeant named Samuel Doe. A member of his cabinet, Charles Taylor, who was born in Liberia but went to college in America, attempted to take power from Doe in 1989. This struggle sparked the first Liberian civil war. War waged for seven years and killed a quarter of a million people. In 1996, several African notables were able to secure a truce between both sides, which ended in Charles Taylor's election as president of Liberia. His opponent at the time was Alan Johnson Sirleaf. Charles Taylor was a brutal warlord. He committed several war crimes and human rights violations during his rule. Through his connections to powerful and coercive African warlords, Taylor's power extended beyond Liberia. He provoked the outbreak of the Second Liberian Civil War in 1999. The Liberians united for reconciliation and democracy in northern Liberia, invaded the country, followed by a second rebel group whose entry shut down the Liberian government. The death toll for the second war reached 200,000. Social worker Lima Bowie started a Christian prayer group, which focused on praying to end the war. In 2003, a Muslim woman named Asatu Bakenneth pledged to join Liberia's Muslim women to Bowie's prayer group. It quickly became an interfaith women's group called the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace. 
In the first week of April of 2003, the group gathered at the fish market outside of Charles Taylor's residence. And for some reason, I, I just love this part. There's like um this there's a history in early modern Europe of um women protesting and they were always called fishwives because they were just like plebeian sort of women that would protest the lack of food. And it's really interesting to me that this women of Liberia mass action for peace, the, their first gathering was at a fish market. Hmm. Um, so thousands of women dressed in white rallied peacefully for an end to the war. They pledged to deny their partner sex until the war was over. The group agreed that Liberia's powerful men were perpetuating the war. They reasoned that if their partners withheld all intimacy, the men may start to take notice and be persuaded to agitate for peace as well. Their efforts continued into the summer when Charles Taylor was indicted on war crimes in a Sierra Leone court, causing him to flee to Nigeria. So I said he he had some connections outside of Liberia. He actually um, instigated this a Sierra Leone civil war. So that's why he was indicted on war crimes. Mm-hmm. The violence of the war was escalating, so the women began using as many forms of peaceful protest as they could devise. They staged sit-ins, rallied for peace talks, and occupied the grounds of government buildings. Taylor's regime agreed to peace talks mediated by the Ghanaian president. When the talks commenced, the women made a human chain around the building and refused to let the delegation leave until an official peace settlement was reached. Authorities attempted to remove the women from the premises, but Bowie threatened to undress. This caused them to retreat in fear of the shame that such a scene might bring to them and their families. Their tactics worked, and the Ghanaian president agreed to meet with them to hear their demands. Charles Taylor resigned, and international peacekeeping troops entered Liberia in August. The Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace aided in the disarmament process and guided the transitional government. In November 2005, the Liberians elected their first female president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Which is badass because she's the first female president in all of Africa. So the women in Liberia used several different strategies to make their voices heard. But in the media frenzy that followed, the women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace credited the sex strike as the difference maker. According to Bowie, quote, Liberian men were either fighters or they were very silent and accepting of all the violence that was being thrown at us as a nation. So we decided we'll do this sex strike to kind of propel the silent men into action. So if you had a beer buddy who was a warlord, you needed to encourage him to lay down his arms. And the way we were trying to do that was to pressurize the partners that we had, husbands and partners who were also sometimes silent in the entire scheme of the war, end quote. Similar sex strikes have been staged by women in Kenya, the Philippines, Italy, Sudan, and most recently, Togo. There has even been a revived interest in Lysistrata in the entertainment industry. Spike Lee's 2015 film, critically acclaimed Chirac, uses the theme of sex strikes to comment on the violent, gun-ridden gang culture in struggling inner-city neighborhoods across the U.S. Lee's modern Lysistrata, played by Dear White People's Tayona Paris, convinces the women folk of two rival gangs in Chicago to withhold sex from their partners until the men agreed to end the gang violence that is tearing their neighborhood apart. The women eventually realize that gun violence in general has contributed to the problem, so holding signs that say, no peace, no they storm a military armory and spark a national crisis. Several attempts are made to end their occupation of the armory, but the women are persuasive and persistent. Eventually, the wife of Chicago's mayor and the first lady of the United States start to take part in the sex strike. After a few sexless months, one of the gangs gives in and agrees to a truce. Their rivals hold out initially, but their hearts are moved by the testimony of a mother of an innocent victim of the gang's crossfire. At the end, all parties agree to new laws designed to curb gun violence and to the funding of new trauma centers to serve the city. So if you're interested in Lysistrata or sex striking in general, you might want to check it out. I've watched, I haven't seen the movie, but I've watched several trailers and it looks super badass. Um, So I wanted to mention that uh, my original intention for this episode was to do sort of a long durée history of sex strikes. Um, if you look online just at random, I don't know, Buzzfeed articles and stuff, it'll say, oh, the long history of sex strikes. And there was a rash of these sort of articles after Chirac came out because people were trying to contextualize the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but then what I found was 
there was like, you know, maybe one or maybe two uh, sex strikes that happened before uh, 1900. Um, and then there would just be like a million of them in the 2000s. And I thought, well, why is it that there really there really isn't this long history of sex strikes? Um, and why do people think that there is? And I think I think the reason is because Lysistrata was yeah. written so long ago right. that people assume, oh, this must have happened all the time in Greece. Um Really, classical scholars don't think that that is actually the case. In mm-hmm. Lysistrata, the sex strike and the whole feminist message behind it wasn't even the point of what, why Aristophanes was writing it. Um, so I think that there is this fiction that, you know, all throughout time and space, women have bonded together and, you know, refused their husband's sex for political change. And that's mm-hmm. really, that's just really not true. Um, and so I sought in this episode to try to figure out why was there this turning point in the 19th century when suddenly this became a thing. Right. Um, and I think that idea behind women not being property and having their own um, autonomy um, is what made this possible and it's conceivable it's absolutely the key and it's funny because i was just having kind of a discussion about uh we're talking about you know the early uh 1900s in our class and so we were talking about margaret margaret sanger and birth control and i was talking about how revolutionary this idea was because women still were not considered to have autonomy over their bodies and sometimes i think that's really hard for people kind of wrap their heads around right that right women were in some senses, still considered property. And so in a society where a woman is considered property, it is dangerous to refuse sex. Right. You know, I mean, women could get hurt, killed, right? right. If, if they're yeah. resisting this because, you know, their bodies are considered the property of their husbands. Right. And if not, they can, they're also risking, um, you know, their husband abandoning them and then right. they are just become financially insolvent and can't even survive or they're risking their husband um i don't know leaving the relationship sexually and getting an std and bringing it into the family that was like a big trope in the 19th century that if you don't give your husband enough sex he'll go and have sex with a sex worker and come back and give you venereal disease Mm -hmm. you know who knows how true that is but the point is that it was there was a lot more things to consider than like you or I would have to consider if we wanted to do a sex strike. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I think people don't realize that and they're sort of um, flattening history when you say, oh, sex strikes have been going on forever. You know, they really, they really And that's what <laughs> I like in this copy. I like how you bring up the idea of basically of, of, of property ownership, right? And Sohonud Oshani, who, you know, didn't have the same kind of conception of property right. or, you know, those types of uh, matrilineal societies or or non-capitalist societies, right. that this is a little more of an option. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I also want to point out, it's so strange to me that, you know, I this the intellectual history of sex strikes revolves around, like, American white women and their mm-hmm. ideas and American white men and how American white women took their ideas. But they didn't really have any sustained sex strikes. I mean, they would sometimes say, you can refuse your husband's sex if you want, but they didn't have this organized thing. Sure. It was too radical for them. What's so interesting to me is that women of color are the ones who take up this idea. And I just feel like, I don't know, I feel like that's always the case is like women of color are just the ones who get shit done. You are you don't understand why sex strikes didn't become a bigger thing in the 19th century. I don't understand why the women who or came up with, century. who, who, who came up with the ideology behind sex strikes, mm-hmm. why they didn't do them. Uh, yeah, because I think for the reasons that we mentioned, because it's too radical. It's, it's too radical. Right. They could get beaten, left, you know, right. It, it's. It's yeah, they possible. And that's what kind of what I was thinking when I was reading uh, Nichols, right? Like, yeah, yeah, you can you can deny your husband sex. OK, yeah, you can. But right. what are the what are the repercussions? What kind? Basically, it, it it's still it's still rested on. Well, what kind of men were they married to? Right. right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, no, that's you exactly married it. to a man that's going to beat the shit out of you. Or are you married to a man that's going to listen to you if you're if you're resisting sex? But, you know, to, to, to pull back a little bit, I think, again, kind of looking at that um, uh, example of American slavery. Right. I think we do see a lot of that happening in America. In a, in, I wish I could put my finger on like a book right now to kind of direct somebody to, Mm -hmm. but definitely like women of color, uh, kind of claiming as much autonomy as they could over their bodies by 
by you know denying sex to either other partners or by using birth control same kind Mm of no right you know same kind of resistance right right yeah Yeah, and i suppose there was that intermediary stage um where uh communism where communist governments um sort of um lended these women-friendly spaces um briefly just because of the suspension of property Mm -hmm. property ownership and things like that yeah so i think yeah i think the property thing is key it's a big one and um in our episode on marriage in America, we'll we'll definitely talk about that as well and kind of bring up that. That will be before um, this one, so we did talk about okay, it. Okay, so we did talk about it. <laughs> so you guys should be well schooled in this then. Yeah, and I think mm-hmm. in in the Victoria Woodhall um, biography, we'll touch on a lot of this stuff too. So they should work well together. All right, cool. Um, and, and then and then Averill's will just be his outlier. Um, well, I think I think one other thing I want to mention is just I don't want to um, go without mentioning the, the problems behind sex striking. And one of them is that um, is it sort of just giving into this patriarchal idea, like just assuming, oh, yeah, all men want sex and right. the only power women have is their bodies. That's not true, obviously, because as you can see with 19th century radicals, they didn't do the the sex strike with their bodies they, they did it got... with their and you know with their minds uh-huh. um <laughs> they were doing mind My, sex strikes yeah but um, no, and and they got you know they got shit done it might not have right. happened like immediately but right. like you were saying like a lot of the stuff that we have in the in the 20th century uh and even 21st century like it all comes back to those 19th right uh, you know late i hate 19th, to say it because sarah century. hanley cousins always says that everything always comes back to the 19th century but i don't know but it's I, true I guess it but does. It is, it is true. It was an amazing. <laughs> it, it was the long America. century. <laughs> um, anyway, so I think that's probably all we have for you today. Um, if you want to take a look at our show notes, um, we have uh, the books that we've you know quoted from extensively here on there. Um, digpodcast.org is our website. Um, follow us on Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, Insta. All, um, all the all the all the things all the we're things. on all the things and uh rate and review on itunes please for some reason those ratings really help us get seen by other listeners so we'd really appreciate it if you jo- enjoyed this episode to leave that five star review for sure um so thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time bye bye date of coercion coercion i do i always, I always say it weird sound very hispanic or something that's that's the only thing I'm worried about is I don't feel like I can get as close. Here, does that I work? Can... Okay, it's my you can my just wrap your legs around yeah, me. Yeah, I just spoon you. <laughs> okay. there's, there's your Instagram this picture. We'll cute. get lots of followers. <laughs> 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 oh my god! Charles Taylor was a beautiful, 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 beautiful. The play was widely successful. Wildly. Isn't that what I just said? You said wildly. Oh, I, I, oh maybe maybe you just say wildly I, weird. The play was wildly. <laughs> <laughs> Aided in the disarm armament. Aided in this. Hmm.